Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Igel. Today I'm super excited to introduce Manu Joseph to you guys. He's a uh, lead data scientist in Dow Centric and he is also very popularly known for his uh, project called PyTorch Tabular which uh, does deep learning models and algorithms on tabular data. So his work has also been accepted in uh, machine learning data science conference in 2021 and uh, he will be presenting his work there. So welcome to the episode Manu. Would you like to uh, probably talk a little more about your uh, your project and then we can continue into the uh, into the topic for today. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction in Nigeria. Um and the the project is basically um uh, like deep learning for tabular data is something that was not really in uh, even now it's kind of uh, people are talking about um, like, X equals versus deep learning and all that, right? But um, although the, the use case is still growing, we have good models on the deep learning side, which is worthy contenters of, uh, of, of uh, like applying models, right? And I wanted to make that process uh, really easy and smooth, so that like anybody, even even somebody without a lot uh, deep knowledge in neural networks, can be they can start training a model uh, and. Like kind of like the scikit learn that you can start uh, like uh, training models very really easily. So that's like the, um, the the intent behind that that library. So it has a few state of the art models already. Uh, things like uh, Node, um, Tabnet, um, auto interaction models, um, FT transformers, Tab transformers. So there are a few state of the art models already, and it's it's since it's a um, open source thing, it's it's a continuously improving and um, uh, like moving ahead kind of a situation so yeah that's the uh, that's the pytorch tablet um, it's, all, it's there on github and you can go and uh, just search pytorch tablet i think you'll probably get it that's amazing i will also be putting in all the links uh, about whatever you're talking about and uh, also <laughs> around pytorch tabular on the description of this video uh, later on when when it goes um, goes uh, as a as a uploaded video on youtube so people can follow that link so yeah, uh, you wanted to talk about uh, zero shot learning for text classification, yes. right? So that's something which was very interesting to me because text classification, even though we have like, you know, we keep getting better and better at models, but there are still a lot of issues which comes with labeling the data. That's, that's a major issue when it comes to, you know, organizational data. I'm not talking about, you know, like having a small uh, subset of data which you're going to get in Kaggle or like any other competitions. But when it comes to actual data, when what organizations struggle with is labeling them because it's going to take them a lot of manual effort and a lot of manual hours for them to label these data. And um, that's somewhere which uh, that you pointed out that if we can have uh, no labels on the data and still be able to apply transfer learning for uh, predicting these uh, on, on the text data, that'll be, that'll be great. So yeah, uh, yes. I won't take up too much time and uh, you can have the stage and you can start talking about, about your project. Yes, yes. Uh, let me share my screen. <coughs> Alright, uh, so it's up, right? You guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, it's visible. All right. yeah. Right. Uh, and before we start, uh, you might have to excuse me. I have a little bit of cold, so uh, I may do <coughs> and things like this all through the session. Uh, but yeah, so uh, like Aishwarya said, right? So the zero shot learning learning uh, is something that uh, that is very important right now <coughs> because, like she said, when when there is an organizational data. Uh, before you start learning and you have you collect a huge corpus of, of label data, uh, this is something that you can get started with. Um, you might not get the, the best performance or the best uh, <coughs> uh, accuracies possible, but this is something that you can easily get started with without with zero zero training labels. So uh, before we <coughs> start talking about uh, zero shot learning learning. Let's see what is like. You all know what supervised learning is, right? You have, uh, say, cat pictures of cats, dogs, uh, horses, and then you have the labels on the on, on the on the other side. So now the model is now trained to to understand what is a cat, what is a dog, and what's a horse, right? But what if you show something which is very different, right? Just something which is not the model is not seen, something like a zebra. Uh, it's 
it's most likely it will just predict something like holes because that's the closest one that you've seen in this training data. Uh, but when, when we say zero shot learning, what we are trying to say is that even though you're not really trained your model to, to, to identify some things or like that particular label, we'll still be able to do something uh, like this. Right? This is again an illustrative thing. It's not a uh, don't hold me to this, but uh, <laughs> suppose you have a training data where you have dogs, cats, hyenas, tigers, everything, including uh, the information from, say, Wikipedia, right? So now this model has seen all of these, all of these different animals. It has also read Wikipedia and everything. It has it has some acquired some knowledge about this real world. And now, if you show it a picture of a zebra. Even though it has not seen the picture of a zebra, it would still say that, okay, this looks like a horse. And from Wikipedia, I know that, okay, zebra is like a horse with stripes. So this must be a zebra. So that kind of, uh, that kind of inference that something that we as humans do naturally is something that we are attempting to, uh, to, to model through these uh, zero shot learning uh, methods. So now uh, you might be thinking that this is very close to say transfer learning. Uh, but there are there is one key difference between transfer learning and zero shot learning. Uh, so in transfer learning, you have a pre-trained model, and you have to fine-tune that model, or basically the head on top of that backbone have to be fine-tuned for its specific task. Task, right? So you have a model fine-tuned for sentiment, and you have a model fine-tuned for news predictions, right? News classification. But on the zero shot zero shot side, right? We don't have this fine-tuning thing at all. We're just taking the zero shot model. And we are, we are asking that whether something is positive or negative. And to the same model, we are asking whether a particular news is, uh, say, science or politics. So that's the key difference. Uh, and that is what also makes this very appealing. Um, so in NLP, uh, there are a few ways of doing, there are many ways of doing zero shot learning. Uh, we'll just cover like four of them. Um, so we'll go into detail in, in each of these uh, these methods. But on a on high level, right, there's one one method which is which uses latent embedding. Uh, so like unlike computer vision, uh, in NLP we have this luxury that the input and the label is more both in the same domain. So they're both text. So we can actually uh, project these 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 things into a shared embedding, a shared space, and then use the distances in the in the um, distances between those those embeddings to kind of do some some sort of thing. Uh, and there are also a few tasks like NLI and question answering, which is which can be uh, creatively repurposed to to do this text classification. We will cover that in the, in the a couple of slides after. And we'll also cover one uh, one model called text aware representation of sentences, uh, which is something that came out in 2020, I guess. ACL, ACL 2020. Uh, so that's again a, a, a creative or a clever way of, um, of let's say, multitask learning. We will do that. Uh, so basically, let's just start with the first one, the latent embedding, uh, and see how it kind of looks at or how it actually works, right? Suppose you have a sentence, uh, let's say it's called, Who are you voting, voting for in print? Right? And now we want to understand whether we're talking about politics, economics, or public health. So what we can do is we'll take a text encoder. It can be something uh, as sim as simple as word to vec or something uh, more sophisticated as uh, uh, like sentence word, um, and you pass these text to it, right? So now, so now you have these seven. Uh, so now we have these seven embeddings. Um, yeah. Now we have these seven embeddings, which is corresponding to each of these seven words. And now we just do mean pooling, or just do a mean of all the embeddings. You get an embedding, which is which, which what we call the sentence embedding. And similarly, we kind of take this politics, economics, and public health, pass it through the same text encoder. You get another set of embeddings, right? Now, since all of them are in the same space, you just find the closest uh, label embedding to the sentence embedding. So in this case, it's, it will most probably be something like politics. So we're talking about politics. So this distance would be the most uh, like smallest one. And that's then our prediction for this particular set, sentence would be politics. So in the setup, if, if you look at it, there is no labels involved. We're just taking text. We're just taking the labels, casting it into a shared space, and then looking at the distances between them. Uh, 
there are also a few levers. Uh, so all of these methods I will also kind of mention a few levers that you can play with to to make this better or worse and can also change. Uh, so one thing is you can have using better text encoders, right? So sentence word is good, uh, but suppose you have uh, you have a text encoder or something which is uh, say fine tuned to your domain. So suppose you're uh, you're looking at uh, movie reviews, and if you have a text encoder which is uh, on movie reviews or fine tuned on movie reviews, then that would have a better representation of your text than the uh, general one. So that's one thing that you can try to kind of make this thing, make this whole setup better. Uh, then you can kind of uh, play around with main coding, max coding, or some of these some of these other ways of combining all of these individual words. Uh, and then sometimes a, a bit of prompt engineering for for the labels uh, also kind of uh, works. So instead of saying uh, say politics just as a word, we can play around with the with the formulation of that something like uh, this is about politics or this is about economics. So make it a sentence, and uh, and then pass it through this text encoder. So this is one thing which is very really, uh, I would say pretty naive or very uh, basic kind of a thing. Um, so if we just move on to the, the next one is uh, is something like the uh, like a more sophisticated way of doing this. Uh, this is a text aware representation of sentence. This is a new model that was proposed in ACL 2020. Uh, so this is also a very clever way of, of repurposing uh, the, the way that we are putting in text into, into BERT or any of these uh, transformer models. So typically what happens is for each of these tasks, right, traditionally each of these tasks We'll have a separate head that has to we have to train, right? So for the movie predict movie sentiment, probably there are P classes, and then there are something that has Q classes and R classes. So instead of having these separate models, what um, what this paper says is that there is a clever way of doing this. So you you say that you give a name to each of these tasks. Uh, so let's say this is sentiment, this is um, news, and something else, right? So now in the training, while you're training this model, uh, you have this. Uh, there is a separator token in the BERT uh, and, and, and things like that, right? So it's basically using that separator token. Uh, and in the first part of that, that sequence that you feed to the transformer, you give the label, which is positive, and the task name, which is sentiment. And then after the separation, you give the sentence that you have to do this, uh, this inference on, right? So now this sequence gets passed through the BERT encoder. And at the end, right, you have the CLS token which comes out in the, at the end. So you basically put like a true or false uh, being a layer on top of it and train so that okay, if I give positive and if the sentence is positive, then it becomes true. And if I have positive and, and the sentence is negative, it becomes false. So this kind of training, so uh, like multiple tasks are, are, are used to do this training. Uh, so task X, Y, and Z, all of them are trained in, in sequence or in random order. And then after that, you have this final model, which is kind of like a multitask model, but also has the property of, of the zero shot uh, predictions. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how, how we do all of this in, in, the, in the notebook that's coming up. But uh, this is one of, the, one of the promising areas or directions of research that, that is currently there. Uh, and like, when you're talking about levers to make it better, right? So there are, a, uh, so the task model, it's not very easy to to. There are no easy levers that you can tweak. Uh, what what you, what you can do is um, you can actually train the task model from scratch uh, by using a uh, using a different backbone. Uh, so by default, the pre-trained model which is available uh, to, to use uses uh, BERT uncased. So you can take turn. Uh, you can change that uh, to something else or something which is more domain adapt adapted or something like that, and then train the model. It should not take a uh, huge, it's not like training work because you have work, but you're just training something on top of it. Um, and then another thing is like if you can take take your time, take time out and then label like very few data points, right? Like say less than 50, uh, which is something that you can just do manually, right? You sit like, in, in one hour, you'll be able to ma uh, easily map or uh, label 50. So then you can actually fine tune the task model with a, with a new task. And that is also a very good way of doing it. So if you have time at the end, we'll, we'll look at that also. Basically, few short classification. Um, so this is the this is another one. And uh, the third method that I was going to talk about is uh, is using uh, natural language inference. 
And this is something that is implemented in the Hugging Face library right now. So in the Hugging Face, there is, there is this concept called pipelines, right? You have the text classification pipeline, you have the summarization pipeline. So similarly, there is a zero shot learning pipeline. And that is actually using this under the hood. Uh, so there is a task called natural language inference, right? So that uh, that's a standard task. Uh, so that's something like this, right? You have a premise. You say that senior is waiting at the window of a restaurant that serves sandwich. I can have multiple hypotheses, right? Multiple sentences. Say I can say that okay, a person waits to be served food. So now the the job of the model is to look at the premise, look at the hypothesis, and see see whether this hypothesis entails the premise or supports the premise. Or is, does it contradict it? So uh, in this case, it should ideally be an entailment. Uh, but if we give, say something like the restaurant is serving pizza, uh, so then we know that the restaurant is actually serving sandwiches, right? So then that that hypothesis becomes like a contradiction. And if you have something uh, very random, right? So something saying that okay, Elon Musk is tweeting about Dogecoin. So that has nothing to do with premise. In such a case, uh, we'll, we'll say that, OK, it's a neutral kind of a hypothesis. So this is a standard task. And we have large data sets available, a standard data sets available for all of this. But what is being done is, is a clever repurposing of this, this setup so that it works for text classification. So for text classification, so uh, the text that you want to classify, uh, let's we, we keep that as a premise, right? We say that, okay, who are you voting for in 2020? So now I have three labels that I want to, want to check. So I basically make three hypotheses. I'm saying that three sentences, this is about politics, this is about economics, and this is about public health. So now I can pass these three sentences or these three hypotheses to the, uh, the NLI model, right? And the NLI model will give me the entailment, contradiction, and neutral uh, logics, uh, as in the, the output from the model as is, right? So now we can actually frame this in two ways. Uh, one is in a multi-class output. Uh, when I say multi-class, uh, something like uh, there is only one label for an item, uh, but there are multiple labels across different items. So in such a case, what you just need to do is take all the entailment logics, put a softmax over it, so you have the uh, the probabilistic prediction over the different um, labels. And now, if you're if you're interested in multi-label. Uh, that is like one text can be uh, can have multiple labels right in such a case you can actually have an individual softmax on each of these three logics that will give you the the scores of and pick the one for the entailment which is what we want to do and that will give you the scores for each of these class so this is something that is uh, right now implemented in the in hugging phase and it's really really easy because later when we see the code right you'll, you'll see that it's a single line code we should actually do this um, and, and there are a few ways that you can kind of start making this model better. Um, one is, again, uh, instead of having a general NLI, NLI model, if there is something, some, some NLI model which is more domain adapted, that would perform better. Uh, another key thing is you can uh, start prompt engineering the hypothesis. So this is about politics is the default one, which is there in the hugging phase. But you can change that hypothesis or the, the structure, right? You can change it to something which is more closer to, to what you're trying to do. Um, so something like, um, yeah, we'll get into that, I think, in the uh, in the note. Right? And then uh, we can basically just check whether multi-label or multi-class is what's working. So this is something that is very easy to work. and. Um, and the next and last type of model that we're trying to uh, we'll, we'll cover is the domain adapted uh, Q&A model, which is question and answering rounds. So uh, question and answering is another standard task in, in in NLP, and there are standard models which does this, right? What it basically does is we give a context uh, to the model and we ask a question to that model. So then what the model does is it takes the context, uh, look at the question, and try to get the answer for that question from this context. So we kind of we can also repurpose that kind of a formulation to, to get um, zero sort classification so that in the context, we give the input text. And in the question, we say something like, what is the text about? Or if it's an emotion classification, we'll say, what is the emotion that we are talking about? So then you will, like, you will get an answer from the Q&A model. But since the QA model is more of a generated model, uh, the generated answer can be anything, right? It need not be politics, economics, or public health. 
uh, it can be something that is mistaken from the text as well or something which is similar but um, to make it into a closed form of politics economics and public health we use the same kind of technique we saw earlier right the latent embedding we kind of uh, embed all of these the answer and the labels and find out the closest label to the generated answer right so uh, now i think we can just go to the code uh, i have a collab notebook um, which which kind of uses this particular data um, so I, I chose a data set which is very very like less known from Kaggle so that all of these big models which are trained on huge data right it's not really seeing this data and then we can cheating our way into this so we uh, took something like a very uh, like less known data set so it's basically like a data set of cleaned tweets uh, about COVID and Corona and lockdown and things like that uh, and it's typically between these these time periods. So uh, it's it's a it's an emotion classification. So each of these texts has been classified into one of these four uh, emotions, and you can see it's a pretty balanced kind of a way, uh, balanced kind of classification as well. Right. Uh, so uh, how I did the test split is in the train. I just put I put one nine seven seven records, um, four ninety five records in uh, in validation, and six hundred and eighteen records in test. <laughs> for, the, for our zero shot uh, kind of a thing, we'll only be just basically taking the test and then doing uh, inference on it. So, um, well, yeah, I'll pro probably pause at this point and probably take a uh, take a few questions if any, uh, and then move ahead to the notebook. Yeah, uh, as far um, like I think till now, uh, people have been asking about having the slides after the presentation. So that's something uh, which I'll be putting on the uh, on the description of the video once I upload it later. So, but yeah, you're good to go. All right, cool. So then, yeah, let's go to the collab. Right, uh, the, the beginning is just basically just installing the ones that, are, that we want. And um, this is just basically, we're downloading the data from Kaggle. So um, if you just follow these, I mean, if you're recreating or running this on your end, you can just basically recreate these steps and download uh, something like something called the Kaggle.json from Kaggle. And then you just run the cell, you can upload that file and the rest of the things will be taken care of. It, and then the rest of the download and everything, the unzip and everything is taken care of. So you just run these two slides, I mean, uh, cells, you'll get the final file. That is the uh, sentiment data. So now the standard imports uh, not interesting. Yeah, so we just read the data. Do you do the basic test, train test split? Um, I do very basic cleaning, uh, which is basically I just remove the lowercase, I mean, make everything lowercase, remove the digits, remove white space, URLs, round brackets, and square brackets, right? Very basic cleaning. Uh, once that is done, yeah, I just basically make a like label encoded because I want to do one baseline model uh, using all the labels so that we are, we know that how predictable this data set is. Uh, so for that purpose, I just have a, a, a TFI DF plus a linear SEC kind of a model uh, and it just trained on this 1977 records that we have. So we can see that, okay, the test performance is um, we have 66% accuracy and 65% F1 score, right? And even the confusion matrix looks uh, okay. There is a bit of confusion between fear and anger, which is understandable, but other than that, it looks pretty okay, right? So this is how um, uh, uh, something which uh, a supervised classification looks like, right? So now let's look at a few ways of doing this, um, the, the zero shot classification, right? So the first thing is latent embedding. So first we'll take a few examples and then uh, look at the code and then uh, look at it, right? So uh, the first thing that you need to do is uh, uh, just take, uh, import this pipeline from the transformers library. And there is a task called feature extraction for this pipeline. And then you can specify the model that you want to use uh, here. And then device, so basically if you want to use the GPU, you can just basically have uh, give yeah, zero or minus one. So that's basically whether to use CPU or GPU. Uh, so now, once you've downloaded this, or we execute this line, right? It downloads the entire the model and it loads into this encoder. So now, to actually use this encoder, it's very simple. You just need to use this. You take this encoder and then 
they pass a text into it. This is as simple as that. You, this is the usage of that particular pipeline. Of course, there are other parameters that you can choose. Or, uh, have to so now let's look at look at how a multi-class kind of a thing looks like. Right? The sentence you say that okay, what who are you voting for in 2020? The classes are business, art, and culture. Uh, so first one is we just basically calculate a sentence vector. Uh, which is really simple. You pass the entire sentence to the encoder, and then you do a mean, right? So you have the sentence vector there. So now we want different label vectors. So you have the different classes. So I pass each of these class to the encoder and uh, store that as a label vector. So that's also done. So now uh, all I have to do is I have the sentence vectors. I have the label vectors. I calculate the cosine distance. Uh, between each of the label and the sentence vector and then I take the argument this is the minimum distance uh, so that's it uh, so that's the core uh, logic that you have that you can do to get this this prediction out um, like one two three four five lines of code Excellent. that's very simple um, and for latent embedding you can only do multi-class because you can only take the closest one um, or you can probably do something like uh, you have a threshold and then select everything which is closest to that uh, within that threshold and all. But it's it's more complicated. Uh, but if you want to do multi-label, I think uh, if you can move on to text-aware representation of sentences. Uh, again, this is also very easy to use. Uh, the pre-trained model for the the task model is available in Flare and uh, and you can basically start using it by just having this line task classify dot load. So once this line is executed, you have the entire model downloaded and ready to use. And uh, to do multi class, you basically sorry, you basically just do you have a sentence class uh, which is part of the fair uh, setup, uh, and you pass the sentence into it. It kind of does all tokenized tokenizations everything. Uh, so once it's done. I just do say tars dot predict zero shot, give the sentence that I want to predict, and the classes that I want to look at. And then you say that okay, this is a multi-label or not. Okay. So once that is done, that single line of code, uh, it's done. You have the predictions ready in the sentence uh, object that you already have. Uh, you can see that okay, this is coming out to be politics, which makes sense. Um, and for multi-label, like I said, right, just change this multi-label false to true. And um, I also add one more class class here. So I, I added who are you voting for in 2020? It's about politics, public health, economics, and elections. So now we know that from our intuition, it should be politics and elections, which is what you get from the model as well. You have politics and elections with pretty high uh, probabilities. Uh, so that's the TARS model. And uh, another model which is equally easy to use is the zero shot uh, classification pipeline from Hugging Face. Um, again, it's very simple. You have the pipeline already. You say that my task is zero shot classification. And I mentioned this is my model. I say Facebook um, this is a large BART model. Uh, once that is done, like, like I told you, right, that's like a single line of code. I say my, uh, I pass my sequence, which I have classified. I pass my candidate labels. And then that's it. It returns me this dictionary with um, the scores. Pick the one with the lowest, I mean, the highest score, uh, which is politics. Uh, similarly, multi label, you have a parameter here called multi class. You just make it true. And then you get scores for each of these things, right? Now you have uh, politics and elections, which are coming up on the top. So both of them are uh, the, the, the predictions. So uh, the rest of the notebook is actually uh, the, the, the evaluation and the test on, on this test data. Uh, so I've actually summarized the results in the deck. So I'll just probably just go back, back there for efficiency. Um, yeah, so this is our baseline model, right? We, we saw this earlier. Uh, so using the latent embedding approach, uh, if you run the that that piece of code on all the on this, all the examples, uh, we get something like forty nine percent accuracy. This is without using any labels, right? Uh, and the test F one is forty eight percent. And even if you look at the confusion metrics, it look it does not look that bad. 
uh, there is a bit of confusion between say again fear and anger and uh, sadness and fear uh, but pretty much it looks okay right uh, considering that we're not used any labels uh, so if you look at the tars model uh, the text aware representation of sentences that also has similar performance uh, uh, like 45 percent and uh, the test f1 fold also 45 percent um, so again here we can see some problems with the model uh, say it's predicting anger almost a lot, a lot of these times which is getting it uh, uh, in the performances uh, lower uh, towards the end we'll also see that there is a, a way to kind of make this model work better uh, using few short using like 50 50 labels or something like that uh, but yeah we'll come to that in the end so now uh, we'll come to the hugging face uh, implementation so there uh, like out of the box or itself we are starting to get better performance we have about 52 percent accuracy there and 50 percent uh -huh. uh, in the multi-class uh, and in the multi-label also it's it's similar right? multi-label i just took the maximum uh, from the alt max right that's also coming out to be pretty good so now I, I we can also kind of make this or tune these models a bit more uh, and by tuning there are two things that we can do one is prompt engineering and the other is domain adaptation so uh, the first set of experiments that we did was uh, using uh, prompt engineering so this example is is the standard or the default way that uh, that hugging face uses but since this is uh, i'm predicting the emotion right so i i can do something like the emotion is that and uh, what dash or the emotion is joy or the emotion the text is is joy so something of that sort i can try and i, I tried this these these four prompts and I can, I can see that here, I'm already seeing some improvement in F1 score. Not a lot of accuracy, but some in F1 score. Um, another thing that we, uh, that, that we can also try is domain adaptation, uh, which is basically right now, the, the previous model was the was a BART large MNLI data. It's trained on the MNLI data sets and all that. But um, what we are doing is what we are influencing is tweets, uh, which is much more closer to say something like Yahoo Answers, right? Your, uh, people are typing it out. Typing, typing it out. So if if we are instead of using the standard BART model, if you're using a, a model which is trained on Yahoo Answers, uh, you can instantly see that the performances are starting to increase. Um, and um, with the new model and the prompt engineering, you can get something like 53.56 uh, accuracy and 53.42 as an F1 score, which is pretty close to the 65 limit that we have which is the uh, one that you have with all trained data, all 1,977 training data. And this is without even single one of them. So now the last one is the Q&A model, um, which is kind of the underperformer among the lot, uh, which is also understandable uh, that, 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 again, we are, we are, we are, you, we are asking a data model to generate a, a, a class label, which is a problem in itself. but if nothing else work and this is something that you can always try um, but one thing i've also noticed while doing experiments is that uh, this typically works in domain adapted q a models if you use a general q a model it's uh, it does not really work well at all uh, incidentally for this i think i was using a t5 model where uh, it was kind of fine-tuned for this emotion task as well um, so it was giving me a better performance so you can see that here it's 42 percent uh, and test F1 is 38. So what is the person feeling is the is the prompt that I was using, the question that I was using. So there were other prompts uh, which were not doing as well as, as this. So and this is also uh, sensitive to the prompts. You can see this, the difference is from 42 to 32. It's quite a bit of difference. Right. So now actually to summarize all of these all of these experiments that we have done. So we can, this is the start, one that we started with, with all the training points, we have 66%. And now we have all of these different experiments that we've done. And this is pretty, and the, the hugging face one is, is by far the best one that we have, we have found. And uh, that is 53%, right? Only a 10% or like 13% difference between the, the baseline supervised and the unsupervised or the zero shot learning. Right? Um, Right, so I think uh, we can also take a pause here 
before we move on to say a few short classification, that's just a two slider uh, to see if there are any questions that uh, are there. Yeah. Uh, so Manu, a question is around what could be a bottleneck for using a zero shot learning uh, model, right? Like um, mm -hmm. when, for example, like when we are trying to train models and there are sarcasm related data mm -hmm. that that poses a, as a bottleneck, right? So in, yes, yes. in zero shot learning, when the model has never seen that data, uh, mm -hmm. does that data have to come from like a similar source or a similar context? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if, if if so, it's not like let's say it's coming from a different context uh, or like a different topic. How can we possibly, uh, you know, tune the model or hmm. like use a different technique to uh, like address that issue? Got it. Got it. So that's a very good point because that's also one of the limitations for uh, these kind of zero shot classification uh, because it kind of depends on uh, say, say if your labels are. Uh, like natural English, right? That you use something like politics, public health, economics. These are all uh, meanings or words that have meanings in in our day-to-day -day life. So in such cases, zero-shot learning can still work. But if if you have like a very specific label, right, which is uh, not say English. So even if you uh, not English as in uh, not the language English, but then uh, how do I say in, in in many organizations, right? We can see that okay, you have uh, some ticket ticket code or ticket um, classification uh, and that might not be the the exact meaning of that I mean it might be just just a name that is used internally so if you have such labels then the zero shot setup will be very difficult to implement because uh, zero shot kind of relies on the model understanding these words and finding out which of these words meaning is most closest to the one that the text that I'm looking at. So if that meaning alignment is there, then this, these things can start to work. But if it is not there, then either you find uh, surrogate labels, which which captures that, uh, that meaning in English, mm -hmm. or you uh, go with something like a few short classification, which is okay. another okay. thing, yeah. That makes sense, okay. And uh, what could be um, when you're when you're trying to do like you know tuning for for such kind of models? What could be a good you know um, a recommended path for somebody to understand the hyperparameters used for the model? Hmm. Right. So yeah, tuning this model, right? That's that's again a catch twenty two because um, when you're saying zero shot, you don't have labels, and to tune the model, you need to have labels. So that is a problem that is there. Uh, mm -hmm. But typically for, for zero shot learning, um, we have to do some kind of a qualitative kind of thing. Like you look at the results of multiple uh, examples and see if it makes sense, some, some things like that. So because an exercise like, like what we did here was possible because we have a label data set. Mm -hmm. But when you're actually doing it, and if you don't have a label data set, you, don't, you, can't, you can't do this comparison. So then it, it becomes a little more difficult to say tune the model per se. Uh, it, it becomes more of a, you, you try this model, you see the outputs, you see the distribution of outputs and all, and then you make an inference on that. So okay. it, it is a little bit limiting that like that. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much the questions we had. You can uh, probably continue with the first shot All right. So just keeping to the end. So out of all the models that we have seen, right, uh, the TARS model, the text aware representation sentences model, that is something that also supports your uh, few short learning. Right? If I just go back to the TARS image. So here, right, you can see that there are different tasks. That is the model is pre-trained for, right? So now, what you can do is you can add another task to the model, right? And then you have a, a, a little, a small number of labeled data points for it, like less than fifty or something. And then you kind of continue training the uh, uh, the trained pre-trained model, like a fine-tuning of on a new task. 
So since uh, it has already a lot of knowledge with, built within by looking at multiple uh, tasks, it's able to, to capture this new task also with very less uh, label, label data. So uh, if I'm just going back to the notebook. Right, so here, uh, we're just taking like 50 samples of the uh, from the validation data. So we have, we take 50, 52 to be exact, exact. Then again, as a baseline, I took the same setup, the TFIDF plus linear CC, and I trained the model with just these 52 points, right? And uh, with these 52 points, what I can see is I have an F1 score of 43. Uh, accuracy again, same, 43. And you know, it's not very good, right? It's, it's here and there. Because you, you're giving very less labels to the model. So now, uh, one other option that I can have, I can do is to like uh, have the standard kind of a fine tuning of, of this thing, right? I take this 50, 50 uh, label data set, uh, I fine tune the BERT model. Right? Uh, that's standard code. Um, and once, the, once I'm done with the training, I did the inference, and I have something like 48% accuracy and a 43% F1. Slightly better than the linear SVC. Probably if we tune and use the correct models in the baseline uh, thing, we might get better performance or match this as well. So now we'll come to the stars where how we can see how it is find a few shoot few shot tuned. Um, the uh, the tutorial is also available on on Flare NLP. We can have the code from there. But basically, what I'm doing here is uh, importing the uh, the necessary things. I create a sentence data set, which is a list of different sentences uh, that we saw earlier, right? This basically does all the talking tokenizations and everything. And then I just basically do dot and label. And emotion is the uh, is the task that I'm uh, that I'm adding. And I'm adding the label also here. So I'm taking all 52, uh, making it into a train data set. Uh, and I have a validation data set, I'm not using it the same, but basically I put two of them, two uh, data sets in the validation. So now I make a corpus, I say this is my train, this is my test. I load the base classifier, which is the pre-trained one. And I have like add and switch to new task. And I'm giving a name for the task. And then I say that, okay, corpus.make label dictionary, which basically does the whole conversion from these corpuses to the label dictionary which task wants. Uh, create a trainer, just the Flare NLP trainer, and uh, give the path where I gave the model. Learning weights, mini batch size, maxi box, all of those things, right? Uh, so then I just basically do a training. It doesn't run for long. Uh, it uh, finishes pretty fast. And then I basically just lo load the model with the point that I've, that I've saved. Then I do prediction on the test set, which I have uh, earlier, right? So now after this, you can see the performance is, say, it's 6165, uh, 61.76 is the F1, which is now really, really close to the one that we have with 1977 labels. So we just have 50 labels now, and we're able to kind of achieve that kind of an accuracy and, uh, and F1 with very small number of uh, label data points. So here, this is the comparison between uh, the different few shot models that we ran. Uh, the baseline supervised was having 43.3. The fine-tuned bird was having 48 and 43. This, is, this was the best zero shot model we had from the, uh, from the zero shot section. Uh, we got about 53.24 and 53.43 using the hugging phase pipeline. Uh, and then the stars, which use the same number of labels, which is getting about 61.65 and 61.76, which is really close to the, the baseline of the full training set as well. And if you think about it, this, this has huge implications, right? Because you don't need now thousands of trainer. To start off with, you just need to say, you need to have 50. So you just uh, sit down, label 50, and then start uh, doing some some uh, few short models like this, which will is a very good starting point, right? In 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 the industry as well, when you're starting to do something, 
Uh, usually, nobody kind of waits uh, or like you wait to collect a lot of data set and then have a good model and all that. People want results fast, and this is something that you can give very, very fast and say that, okay, this is my first level model. And in the back end, I can keep uh, having more labels and have a proper classification model trained and et cetera. So, yeah, so that's the, that's, we've come to the end of our talk. One of the questions here, Manu, uh, when uh -huh. you were talking about, you know, the um, the confusion metrics about how is it comparing to a baseline model, etc. How do, how do people decide on the baseline model? Like, what do they compare with every time that they're, okay. let's say I'm pulling in a new data set. Let's say mm -hmm. I'm um, working with the new snippet. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I'm trying to classify that news is again, like from which genre. So mm -hmm. uh, how, what do I consider as a baseline model in that case? Okay. So the baseline model that we've considered, right? That's basically not like a, how do you say? So the purpose of that model is to see how predictable this data set is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I'm sure that if I if we spend spend enough time in in the vectorization and the model tuning, we can get better accuracy than this, like yeah. 66 and 65. Uh, but basically, this is just to see that okay, this is the kind of best case scenario or the approximate best case scenario, mm -hmm. so that we have some bearing on the other results that we have. Like okay. Without this, if you have like hotline nine point and fifty one, right? It means much less, right? We don't know how yeah. what is the best that can be. So that's yeah. the only purpose for this for this baseline. So mm -hmm. uh, for that you can like choose anything. Uh, okay. like, I usually choose something very simple, uh, which is where I start off with, right? A very simple model uh, with, with very less effort. I can have a baseline mm -hmm. established, and then start working on top of it. Yeah. So what I meant was because like, mm -hmm. when you're choosing a, uh, a Kaggle data set, it's something which uh -huh. has been tested on. It has been worked with, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. uh, people have tried different kinds of models. Like some of the people have probably tried with labels, uh, with mm -hmm. manual labeling, and then they are creating a baseline value that, okay, like, this uh, mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. data set has a baseline value of say 52%, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when the data is unseen, like nobody has ever mm -hmm. worked on it before, like nobody, knows how predictable that data set is that's how mm -hmm. it comes in an organization setting right like i'm given right. say like uh, some two zettabytes of data and mm -hmm. i'm uh, i'm asked to run a run a model which without any training labels that's that's where we are applying zero shot learning mm -hmm. so um i try with like say one or two models and i see that okay like both the models are very similar in in mm -hmm. their accuracy or like in any metric that we're trying to measure then how do I set up a baseline model in that case? Like when when the, the data has not been worked with before, like there's no there's no baseline to start with in, in the first place. Right, right. So see, in the example that you mentioned, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like there are no labels at all, right? In yeah. that case, you don't have a baseline at all because yeah. this the zero shot model is the first approach that you're trying or the first try that you have you, you're having to get get some kind of a result right even if you get that result in the true zero short, short sense you won't be able to evaluate them uh quantitatively yeah because yeah. you don't have an accuracy of that one yeah yeah so exactly. what you typically can do is one is you do sample checks right you uh, like using the knowledge that you acquire by working with this data you kind of find out cases where um, you think that the model can uh, do bad yeah. and then start doing inferencing on it so that you, you get the worst cases out and then another thing is if you if you already know right uh, that like okay my ideal distribution for for in these cases right uh, is these labels is, is so and so Right. Mm -hmm. I, I expect this this class to be maximum and this class to be minimum and etc. Yeah. So if you have that knowledge, then you can you do use that also to compare, right? You have like a you inference on everything, you have the predictions, and then you compare yeah. the predicted distribution to the like supposed to be distribution. That's also another way you can start to look at look at this. But then this whole zero shot area is a problem because we don't have labels and in the true yeah, sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Agree. So uh, yeah, that's that's very helpful. And 
um yeah i think this was very helpful that you know like we have an understanding on how to approach these different scenarios even with few shot classification so um if you can share the notebook and uh, the the ppt with uh, with me i can put it on the um, on the description of the uh, of the video so mm -hmm. people can just check it out later and also i will be putting in uh, manu's linkedin uh, profile so you can uh, connect with him follow him and uh, like shoot any questions to him if you have any yes so absolutely. great great thank you so much manu like for taking out time and uh, you know walking us through each and every smallest of details and that's that's something i i feel is very important that we don't only look at um how things were looking as as a finished product but also go through what could be going wrong and how did you actually approach the approach the problem so that approach or like that's uh, that thought process is very important for you for you to share and uh, something which everybody can learn from and yeah this is great and uh, i hope to see you again because uh, i really like the way you're presenting and it's it's very helpful like just uh, the way you're sharing a your thought process is very helpful so mm -hmm. i i hope to see you again uh, sharing more of your work yeah, um, definitely yeah thank you yeah. so much for taking out time and uh, yep yeah, i'll see you soon yeah see you soon thank you